Well, here we are. I thought for the longest time that we'd already done a terrible coverage of DreamWorks' Boss Baby sequel, but it turns out no. That was just a NAF trailer reaction we'd done once. Back during lockdown, it was so long ago. So let's finally crack this production I've practically been avoiding as of late. Time for me to watch this terrible movie so you don't have to. <sighs> and apparently they announced a third movie back in 2021 as well. Okay, this is just research for that then. So, we begin with an admittedly pretty good DreamWorks logo adaptation before learning that things have properly changed since the first movie. You're all grown up. Eight, it nine. even happened to me. The characters aren't babies anymore. Isn't that kind of going to complicate your boss baby premise? But okay, they were technically grown at the end of the first movie, so we'll give it a pass. Tim here now has a family and kids of his own. He's a stay-at-home dad. I hardly get to stay at home. Buckle up, Templetons! What? So this admittedly, I've got to sing some praises for in this movie. The directing can be nice. I always quite liked turning slice of life moments into overdramatic action sequences, very Nietzsche Joe. And driving a car feels like this. Great! Let's see how long that lasts. Actually quite a bit for the first three minutes. This sequence montages out to a whole recap of the past 20 odd years, and shot as one big camera motion in a lot of places. You got micro dramas of teddy bear building, wife Carol being the actual successful one, we learn of the spying new toddler Tina. The older sister Tabitha who just got into a great school, as well as what happened to the other babies. I barely remember the other babies. Jimbo is still called Jimbo and is also mayor somehow, though his wife is the smart one, and the triplets, there were triplets, are police officers. And of course, Ted, well, he grew up to be the boss, all right, is actually a CEO boss. No surprises there. So now we're all caught up. What's the plot? Well, it all starts with older sister Tabitha. What are you doing? You gross. It went everywhere. She has started to outgrow Tim's overactive imagination and childish antics. Fitting as well, since her argument is... I'm trying to do my homework. Or I'm doomed. Oh. What kind of awful parent doesn't know the concept of homework? The directing may be great, but I can already tell this writing is going to be frustrating. Tabitha is a brainiac kid who seems to already be growing up, and baby man Tim just can't handle it. Though to be fair, she is also a bit on the rude end too. She's completely against all the traits of the good night show, doesn't want music, doesn't want hangouts, and wants to be just as successful as Uncle Ted. Plus she's critical of the age old boss baby one story Tim always tells. The jokes were good, right? Tim. I think it's about time you had a midlife crisis. So, upon his life not being quite the way he wanted it to be, Tim broods in the attic, lamenting over where the time went. The sweet breath of freedom! Wizzy? And then the Toy Story ripoff comes back around. I forgot about Wizzy, not gonna lie, but I faintly remember him. A sentient alarm clock that moves in front of everyone for some reason. They have a catch up, they almost share advice, and then we hit a nerve. Like, like I did with my brother. I know I've been giving a lot of praises so far, but I think I really like Wizzy too. His dialogue and jokes are good, as are his delivery and movements. Do I actually like a boss baby movie? Well anyway, Tim soon leaves Wizzy in the dust to go and investigate sounds coming from Tina's room. Really? Tim and Tina? The writers really pulled out all the stops for names, huh? And of course, it leads to the reveal of... You, you can talk? Yeah, I'm in the family business. Is there no Toy Story logic at all in this movie? It's weird enough that the literal alarm clock interacted with an adult before realizing who he was, but now even the boss babies will just talk to anyone? Are there no standards in this universe? And so now Tina jumps up front to blag with her exposition, all against a very aghast and distracted father. There's a crisis at Baby Corp. What is it this time? <gasps> Kittens? No. No, Tim. They already did that. They don't just have one problem on repeat. So what follows next is one big, big argument. And this sequence is surprisingly long. And it's got two points. Tina is trying to get Tim to call Uncle Ted to solve the crisis, prying into why they never talk and why he won't reach out. That's all the dialogue covered. Visually though, it's a decent feast, taking on all sorts of Madagascarian slapstick physics as baby Tina teleports around the room and always ends up having Tim's phone to hand him again. It's a good bit! And then it keeps going, and then it doesn't move on. You start to black out and realize this scene with all the lamp and shadow lighting kind of reminds you of the shadow elements of the cancelled Me and My Shadow project, and even Tim looks to have the same character design as Dad, but it's not voiced by Bill Hader anymore. He's voiced by Toby Maguire. Toby Maguire? What was I doing again? This is really disappointing. 
and now I'm getting mad. Yeah, then it doesn't go anywhere anyway. Tim does instead revert back to dad mode and drops his kid off like she isn't sentient again, despite everything. What's going on in his head, man? He can't comprehend homework. He blatantly ignores baby court. This isn't a codenamed kids next door amnesia thing after a certain age, so... Why is this guy so stupid and illogical? Brain seriously didn't develop since the last time we saw him. But alas, the very next day, he arrives. Was was that the sound of a Team Fortress 2 medic doing something hidden in there? Anyway, he popped up after some voice replication hijinks from Tina, and now they're explaining in the kitchen. Though Ted is the one who doesn't remember anything. So... Why does Tim? Well, after your classic miscommunication and never actually listening, finally we come to the payoff with... But may I make a suggestion? Why don't you both suck it? It's a whole ninja. And then it's baby core time. Remember, the dummies teleport you into an ethereal state where your soul is kind of ripped out from you and you're taken to the company in the baby dimension or something. Suddenly, Ted remembers everything. I mean, of course he does. We have to get there eventually. And so, after ogling for a while with old rooms and new rooms and also a golden statue, it's time for the next exposition dump. The story plot point told 20 minutes in by a TV screen. How very Gen Alpha. Hello, my name is Dr. Erwin Armstrong, founder. He's the bad guy, you know. It's always the way. And he goes on to explain the philosophy of the school and about how they want to push parents away in order to really force children to learn, learn, learn. Truly, and evil school. Tim agrees for being the overbearing dad that he is, and Tina tells the two that they are to be given a special formula that will revert them back to babies so that they can infiltrate the school. Yup, that's the plot. For the adults to be turned back to their past selves. Sounds very sequely to me. <laughs> it's the perfect disguise. Forget just following soon after the events of the first movie. Let's jump ahead 20 years and then retroactively integrate something to go backwards anyway. That makes sense. Now, in an odd twist of fate, the two adult men are now fighting over the baby formula. They really, really want to become babies again. But putting logic aside, this once again is a moment of director Tom McGrath really just showing off. In the past, he's directed the Madagascar movies and Megamind, so it's almost baffling to see real care and attention being put into this franchise. And you can see what I'm praising here. This is one big fight sequence between Tim and Ted. Yes, set to some crammed in pop culture music, but it's justified in a little more context, as they ended up knocking one of Tim's record players, so they would be playing this music. Kinda. Weren't they just growing up in modern day last time, so that still shouldn't make sense? Oh, no. Apparently the first movie is set in the late 1980s. And even now, Tim just about has a flip phone. I kind of wish it was more notably 80s. They put more care in than I thought. And I haven't even gotten to gush about the main bit that the animation is showcasing. Them de-aging with so many little gags. It's actually the only real thing I remember from the trailers because I kept pausing on the most extreme freeze frames. But yes, the bickering ends and the boys are back to their predecessor image. <laughs> But the drama hasn't finished, as there's still way more of another action sequence. I know we're going on a lot about how these kind of infant movies throw stuff at you just to keep your attention the whole time, but this is doing it totally right. Now it's an intensive choreography of Tina distracting the sister and mother, all the while the babies are sliding around in the background. There's not so much iconic beats to latch onto, like Madagascar has its moments, but this baby projectile move at least touches on the surfaces. And as everything just about goes perfectly right up to the last minute, there's somewhat of an escape. So that night, they dialogue out pieces of the plan. They're both going together. What a surprise. They've got baby spy gear. Tim's voice is inexplicably still the same as his adult one. And director's still directing. Sometimes it's just a nice execution. Thanks so much for coming in, ladies. And other times it's all right. Boys, let's get some sleep. And that night, Tim has a nightmare. We are coming to a third of the way into the movie and the pacing is a drool. Adults have become baby and the mission is just briefly thought about so far. But what it's lacking in actual story progression, it is giving in droves with visual eye candy and emotional development. Instead of telling us Tim's fears and reservations, here it is being shown to us and also told. It's a dialogue scene. 
Tim worries of the distance he has with Tabitha, worried for being a fraud of world's best dad as well as... Well, that's about it, really. No concerns on any other issue? The brotherly thing? Disappearing from his wife? Or lamenting the passing of time some more? Alright. But for one point, it's brilliantly executed. I love the sort of wide lens dolly zoom effect we have, making Tim shrink more and more on his giant chair. Was it the Toy Story 2 falling in the void nightmare? Yeah, we've all been there. And then one more, more action scene of the oh-so-relatable oversleeping rush playing atop this greatly composed violin piece from Steve Mazzaro and Hans Zimmer. It all brings it together for a massive classic romp. <laughs> So the fact that you're telling me that baby Alec Baldwin wasn't awake at 8 a.m. is clearly a plot hole. This guy mustn't have been a real Sigma male rise and grinder if he's still asleep by the time the sun's up. And even if you put him back to being a baby now, they certainly don't do lions. But it's one more hurdle in the way of actually making progress. Or it would be if there wasn't an immediate resolution in the form of Ted's backup plan. It's the pony. There's been a pony this whole time for some reason. Repeatedly established. I just didn't care enough for it. Don't worry about it. It's another breakout scene. Initially kind of generic. It's just a pony, but then it gets bigger. There's a giant cub sleigh. The family are in sight. Being the closest that we once felt. That's so great. We gotta go. <laughs> you are a terrible driver. The other toddler adults get involved, kind of making it generic again since it's just checkboxing all the beats. There's a Christmas tree that for some reason is being lit up in the middle of the day and it all literally snowballs together Katamari style. Oh, Tina. <laughs> and after a brief, another bit, finally, just 35 minutes into the movie do we actually reach the school. Mission start. On Haseon. And Buenos Dias. Thank you. There's a whole thing about what color typees they have that compartmentalizes the kids into different districts. It's just more fluff. And then Tim goes to meet Tabitha. It's pretty standard stuff as well. A chic modern classroom. There's somewhat of a school bully. <laughs> and also the teacher is virtually on a device, but it's, you know, it's, it's happening. That all competition is... Healthy competition! The toddler room is way more chaotic, though at the same time, it's probably easy to see why. Kind of just feels like another Toy Story 3 scene, you know? <laughs> now, in fact, this was actually my stopping point in the movie. I am not kidding. The sentence before this one was written months ago, and I just... I just gave up on this movie. It's just kind of slush, you know? It's to the point all of Christmas happened, and now I've changed my writing format to a more improv style, because I've just... I'm too bored to pause every 10 seconds to write for a minute. I would assume we're about halfway through this movie, and only now does it seem to actually start, you know? But let's get into things anew. What we have next is a two-piece montage from Tim and Ted's perspectives, each dealing with their classrooms. For Tim, it's all about physics for a moment, before speed running through every single different topic there is, with this whole rotatory system that honestly shows a nice piece of, I guess, artistic design? A lot of the creative elements of this movie seem to come from the actual aesthetics and directing of this movie, rather than the actual plotline. But hey, I guess it gets your point across. All the while, Ted is also dealing with his scenes whereby he is in the middle of the Toy Story 3 scene, trying to get out. He wants to escape through a vent, and there's all sorts of different toddlers we're gonna see for micro gags. From this montage, we also learn that Tabitha is actually genuinely very smart, seeming to know the answers to all of the science questions, as is mostly the point of this montage, really. Meanwhile, the boss adult man baby ends up controlling the toddlers to try and make their point. Then it just doesn't succeed, so we're just kind of delaying more in this montage. There's a lot of fluff in the middle of all this good direction. And then eventually he climbs out via glue. Just glue directly, stick it to your body, and it'll get you up a wall. Somehow. But hey, it's not much better on the Tim front. Um, he's almost accidentally started up a whole Back to the Future romance. No. No. You're amazing. <sighs> Don't fall down this slippery slope, boy. So as both boys have their successes and failures, Tim successfully bullying the main bully archetype of this classroom, and Ted actually successfully getting out, Tim is sent into isolation. It's a tiny little torture box with Sail Away playing as your classic pop culture plug. Meanwhile, Ted as a baby actually manages to make it to the head teacher's office, whereby we come to learn that this head teacher was expecting him, knows why he's here, they're both fully complimentary of each other, 
and it turns out that the villain was... Surprise, surprise. Thank you for making it halfway through this video. If you haven't already, come subscribe. This is the age-old terrible series where we cover awful movies from the animation field, and this one has long been suggested. But if you have any other recommendations you'd like us to cover, or you want to see one of the many old ones we've already done, check it out on the playlist, or let us know in the YouTube comments down below, or on our Discord. Otherwise, let's get back to... the terrible Boss Baby sequel. <sighs> Can't wait for the third one. A baby. Wow. Whoa. Oh my god. Now with the head teacher suggesting that they could use somebody like the boss baby. And there's a tear beyond blue when it comes to success. But first we need a playground scene whereby the characters can now start to communicate over what's been going on. You've got Tina witnessing the events on the iPad so she is at least locked in. And Tim is finally released as well since they finished their time out in the torture room. And this whole scene is meant to be, I think, just kind of a reference to Shawshank Redemption. It's like prison when you've got super smart kids. There are toddlers gambling, a violin kid. Somehow we're being antagonized by acorn heads. So what? Did you flunk coloring class, kids? <laughs> and Mr. CEO Boss Baby is, of course, already the super leader of it all. But as plot lines would have it, instead of really communicating as brothers, they instead have a fight over the miscommunication of not lining up and both succeeding on their separate montage missions. Thing you're ever gonna succeed at is being alone. Fine, fine. Yeah, like, that's kind of a weak plot line. We then get more scenes that are just kind of adding fluff to numbers. You know, we see that the bully is going to try to sabotage Tabitha's musical number that she'll have later on at the final climactic moment of the movie. There is admittedly a fun bit of Tim as a child now, you know, this sounds weird out of my head, but oh well, flirting with the mother character because obviously he is the husband. I don't know if I'm starting to fool for like <laughs> middle-aged boomer humor, but I, I, I find there's an entertainment factor there. What? You never told me you had an older sister who could drive. What can I say? This boy is based. And then with Tim taking a ride back to his own family home to really just confuse things and lead closer towards that back to the future rabbit hole, Ted is left behind at the school going to said after party, where he discovers that it's all one big company with hypnosis as the name of the game. What is all this? There are ninja babies in the hallway, the kind that you saw all throughout the trailer footage, which, you know, is nice. It's, it's a gimmick, I guess. You can go with it. And then Ted is scooped up by the baby headmaster into some sort of pod where he learns about the real underlining elements here. He is teaching babies how to code. And specifically, they are writing apps. Stock Crush. You did Stock Crush? I love Stock Crush. Oh. Yes, this movie is a commentary on social media. Of course it is. Are you really surprised? Several apps have been mentioned during this movie, which is like nice little additives. These are all being produced by the headmaster. Meanwhile, for just a little bit of fan service really, Tim makes it back home, generally chatting with his own family. And then the grandparents arrive unannounced. I don't think they established that before. And they might recognize him. Tim didn't wear glasses. Ah, oh, that's right. If not for the glasses. First we were ripping off Toy Story, now we're ripping off Superman logic. All right. Meanwhile, the actual plot line is going on with the headmaster giving out his big old montage, telling the babies no more screen time and they're all devastated, of course. You know, commentary. Whilst at the same time telling the code babies to say no to everything. Why do parents get to be in charge anyway? They had their chance and what did we get? Pollution. Politics. I mean, he's not wrong. And so he wants to lead a baby revolution where there are no more parents, which I guess is somewhat of a plot line. Oh, but okay, they do manage to loop around the Tim family fan fiction scene into actual plot. As we come to hear about Tim and Ted's past experiences through everyone else telling stories, which is, you know, it, like it's decent. It connects to the main theme of, you know, the brotherly relationship. And it gives a new perspective on what they're like as brothers. But at the same time, this has now gone into the opposite of where the start of this movie was. Whilst before it was all show and barely any tell, now it's just people talking. Talking around the table, looking a little bit expressive. Saying, wow, Ted could be so uptight. Oh, Tim, what a active imagination that kid had. He was so proud of his little brother. They were best friends. It's like... A nice emotional moment, but suddenly it's like the movie just sort of 
gave up, wanted to tell plot instead of visuals, and doesn't know how to mix the two together. But following that, we then do get a really nice scene with Tim and Tabitha. Seeing a little bit of what his daughter is interested in without the lens of being the fatherly figure, we see all of the sciencey things that Tabitha's obsessed with and how weak she feels when it comes to music, something that Tim is very happy to help with. There's no place like home. Anyway, Tim's major advice is to imagine that you're inside the song, everything's actually happening and you can see the notes. Follow that with an actual music splay out of seeing the notes. Alright, it's a nice idea. Don't think it counts as actual singing lessons, but um, you know, it's decent, semi-standard directing there. She practices in front of a fake crowd. This bit's genuinely actually kinda nice. And then suddenly and immediately, Tabitha can sing perfectly out loud because it's just easy. It's always been easy. What a schmuck I am. I had to pay to learn how to sing. And with that, Tim then goes on to leave. And with us needing to stitch together the plot real quick, now Tim and Ted reunite and make amends. With the boss baby reading the file from Tim with a heartfelt message attached. And then it's immediately just sort of sorted. All right. And then just before they call it into Baby Core properly to solve the situation, Tina comes in to sabotage the call so that the two brothers can work on it himself. You know, it's the theme of the movie. It's all about family fixings. And so they plan in the attic, cross-dissolving between them talking about the plan and then actually enacting the plan. Somewhat. We get to see how it works, setting up the headmaster, putting something in his back so that you can control the suit, gluing with the bully to sort things out there, having a dance sequence on the side. Suddenly it's Hotel Transylvania apparently. But then as we come back to the planning room again, we come to learn it was all their imagination as that was just the best case scenario. So I wonder how the real thing's gonna go. And so here they are, for the big musical number all the parents are here to see, set up in the auditorium. And the app of the day is QT Snap that this movie's invented. Uh, not the worst name in the world. Anyway, they perform a song about global warming, which I think, in a way, kind of fun, just to be poking at how the kids are genuinely thinking about this kind of thing. And then, whenever a parent takes a photo, they become hypnotized. With the show encouraging them to take photos, it all becomes one big ploy that way. Whilst on the side adding a religious joke in there. Agnostic! And Why do I get the sense this is a genuine piece of Christian cynicism plugged in here? And just as everyone works out what's going on, they realize they need to pull the plug, but there's multiple hurdles to pull the plug. Tim wants to go and see Tina perform. Ted can't reach that side of the state. You know, it's a lot of delays. Tim rejects the plug because he doesn't want to stop his daughter. They argue over the plug and there's all things going on. Really, it becomes one big climax at the end for the brothers as they argue over how they weren't there for each other. You didn't even come to my graduation. Ah, which one? Before finally being caught by the villain. It's always the way, you know? The villain wins towards the end. But it's Tabitha's turn. The boys are plugged into the box, being flooded as well for extra good measure, as Tabitha sings her heart out up top. Huh? Huh? C can anyone else hear her? Naturally, everyone is surprised. The parents take all the photos in the world, and the boys make up now that there's a threat of drowning. Who needs a marriage counselor? You're a great dad, and you don't even get paid. And so as the two boys say all the classic things to immediately kindle their relationship, everything continues on just a little bit longer. There's more singing, there's more hypnotizing, there's more comments to each other. The truth is... It's lonely at the top. Yeah, tell that to Jeff Bezos. I'm sure he's miserable. And so we come to the end of it. The villain calls everybody out. Now he can command a standing ovation. These parents have essentially become zombies. Social media bad, everybody. And for some reason, Tina didn't even communicate this whole time. She had access at everything. Tabitha cries to herself, knowing her father wasn't there to see her. Finally learns that Tabitha is smart, learns that the dad's stories are true, and now it's all coming together. Uh, kind of quick, but sure. The villain now has a dance sequence. Tabitha instantly finds where they need to go by looking for air ducts. And just as the boys are about to die, they manage to deus ex machina their way out by none other means than the pony. The pony kicks them out of the box as they all head to the acorn tree in the center. It's time for a big old confrontation sequence with the ninja babies. With all the other toddlers thrown into the mix. It's like, nice, it's decent. There's a creepy toddler girl I didn't establish. She gets a sequence in there and all the ninjas, they all run away. 
Time for the final confrontation at the acorn tree with the villain. I've got something better than a partner. I have a brother. Yeah. God, this movie really hits different when you're an only child. Anyway, it's suit versus suit as they manage to hijack another one of the head teacher's bodies, apparently. The villain calls in all of the parents. They stick to lollipops on the trees. They're trying to climb up to where he is. Actually, it's a pretty great piece of choreography. All the elements just all coming together. They climb up onto the branches. They get into the acorn tree. But there's one thing I can't not mention. I love Jeff Goldblum as much as the next person. He's playing the villain, right? And just this villain's deliveries are all... So flat. Like, listen to this. Visually, it's not even like terribly made. It's a nice piece of choreography. I think it's one of the highlights of Sony's director pool. But Jeff Goldblum doesn't fit in an action sequence. Like, did he not know what was going on? There's also other cracks in the script you can find. Like, listen to this next line. Oh, Grandpa. It's Night of the Living Boomers. Talk about crammed in flat execution and Kinda doesn't make a lot of sense either, to be honest. They just wanted to use the word, didn't they? Anyway, a few lowercase r's later, and finally, the wizard wakes up, the boys start aging up, and the sequence gets a little more chaotic from that front as they interact. Kind of. It's actually just a lot of delaying, but it's one more element. Ted is immediately aging through the years, whilst Tim is lingering backwards for some reason. Random hesitating hurdles come in, like they try to start the sprinklers, and then they don't go off. Yeah. And then, as the villain thinks they finally succeeded, they go and interrupt their own battle to ha have some coke for celebration? How about you want me have a little toast to the baby revolution? It's a pause for no reason. And then we already established that there's Mentos all over the floor, so... Like, it's... This is just like a crappy rendition of Wreck-It Ralph, but worse. They never... I don't think they even established that he drinks coke to celebrate all the time. It's just... Oh! There's something established. I better set up the thing that kills me now. Uh, and so they do. This movie is like, writing-wise, stitched together by ripping off every other animated movie you've seen. Anyway, doing so explodes the acorn. Tabitha almost falls, but is caught by Ted, who instantly ages up through all of his aging. What? Like, I like the ending of him being an adult when he catches her, but why was it all at once? Where's the logic, guys? Please. And then comes the final sickly message of the movie. You know, Doc, childhood doesn't last forever, but family sure does. The parents then drop their phones and ah, that's the happy ending the movie wanted. Kids are reunited with their parents, the Templetons have a chat, and Grandpa takes one last photo. Get together, this, we gotta get this. Here we go. Dad, no! What? Post credits now, Tabitha is singing to the family. The nan, in her extra overly messaging way, throws away anything close to a phone or a camera. And then Ted does one last surprise by actually appearing. Wowee. The daughters join in. Tina skips a business call. Mum, here's the baby phone call. So I guess that's where they want to go with the third movie or something. It's all for a snowball fight in the garden with one final message. And you should always be nice to your brother. Ah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, thank you for that one. I'll, I'll consider it. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Uh, the villain baby goes home. Okay, so he, ju he just has a papa and a mama. And also, they don't even seem to be problematic. They seem happy that he's there. And like, like it was like a lost dog or something. Now, that's the end. Huh? That just asks so many more questions. But I'm sure we will not get an answer for the third movie. That was The Terrible Boss Baby 2. It went in some strange directions. It didn't really start until halfway through the movie. And even then, the first half was great and visual. The second half was a whole lot of exposition. I would go on to say that I can understand why some of it's liked. At the same time, oof, it's, uh, it's certainly a Boss Baby movie. But on that note, I'm going to end things off there. My name's been Daz. Thank you very much for making it to the end. This has been a video I've been working on for practically months at this point. Oops. Let me know what other movies you'd like me to cover in this terrible series, and I will see you in a little bit.